Good morning, uh, Fremont. This is fall break at Warner Pacific College where I work, and so Judy and I are taking advantage of that at Depot Bay. See you next Sunday in the flesh. The sermon topic for today was Jesus enters and upsets Jerusalem. I'd like to modify that a bit and say Jesus enters and upsets everybody. The Bible's a strange book. In many respects, it's a deeply foreign book with a particular, some would say peculiar, orientation to the world that challenges us on so many levels. It's about a different time and a different place, and it tells about that time and place in challenging and sometimes off-putting ways. Sometimes it's obscure and sometimes far too familiar. The truth is that the Bible is a hard book. It's a hard book to read, and not only because of its language, but also because of how it and the church claim that it contains truth with a capital T and describes a challenging God who actively involves himself, God's self, in the world and life. And it is in this regard, I think, that we of the West, and especially those of the 20th and 21st century West have the greatest struggle because of our uncertainty about truth and our tendencies to individualism and relativism. I have a friend who likes to say, don't should on me in response to anyone telling him how he should live. Yet the Bible regularly tells us how we should live and talks as if there is only one way, one truth to life. We like to think that there are truths, and what is true for you may not be true for me, which places us, frankly, often in an adversarial relationship to what we read, or what a pastor might tell us from the pulpit. Our scriptures today are troubling like that. The triumphal entry the cursing of the fig tree, the driving out of money changers, the power of mustard seed faith, authority and taxes and tithes, the resurrection of the dead, power and poverty, all of this so in our faces. What am I to do with this one who speaks with such authority and demands that I follow him and be like him? Frankly, I sometimes feel a little more sympathy for the Pharisees than I'm probably supposed to, and this is likely because I like things laid out the way they like things laid out. I like things to be the way they're supposed to be, right? And I think I'm not alone in that. In the midst of this pastiche of demanding actions and speech, Jesus zeroes in on the heart of the matter and it is here in the greatest simplicity that we find the greatest demand. Jesus, quoting from Torah, the heart of the Old Testament, the heart of the Hebrew Bible, answering the question, what is the greatest commandment? And says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, and there is no other commandment greater than these. Whew. Here is the heart of biblical truth, simply said, directly stated, and so hard because it demands wholehearted devotion to the God whom Jesus reveals to us. I, who struggle with commitments and demands, find this kind of a focused attentiveness to be a real challenge. Now, I'm not alone, thank God, um, because I have the church, and I have God who loves me with the same kind of focused attentiveness that God desires from me and the Holy Spirit who comforts me even as she confronts me and who empowers me even as she corrects. Yet here I stand face to face, as it were, with these commandments around which Jesus says, 
all the law and all the prophets and all truth revolve. I'm called to love God out of all proportion to everything else I love. And yet, I am promised that this God whom I am called to love with my whole being is the God who is with me as I am led by that God into all truth. Thanks be to God.